To begin today's event, I would like to call upon Varshini to deliver the welcome address. No matter how your day has been, the beauty of setting sun will make everything serene. A very good evening to one and all present here. I take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this virtual gathering on introduction to systems thinking. I would like to welcome Mr. Shakti Sharan, Senior Fellow, Pixera Global India to this virtual gathering. We welcome you, sir. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. A. Muruganatham, President, Krishna Jayanti Incubation Center. Welcome, sir. My heartiest welcome to Dr. Cherian Thomas, sir, Documentation in Charge, Krishna Jayanti Incubation Center. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome the core team members of Krishna Jayanti College Incubation Center. Finally, I extend my wholehearted welcome to all my dear fellow mates. Once again, I welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ashini. A very dedicated, stimulating, and selfless man who always helps us at every stage. One such person is Dr. A. Murunganatham, President, Christo Jayanti College Incubation Center. Dr. A. Murunganatham will now address all gathered today. I warmly invite you, sir, for the presidential address. Good evening, one and all present here. Uh, good evening to uh, Mr. Sakti Saran, uh, resource person of the day. Uh, first of all, uh, we like to thank uh, from the bottom of our our heart for accepting our invitation and giving a session for our students. So, uh, and uh, next I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cherian for arranging this particular session. So, uh, we, Krishna Jayanti Incubation Center, we humbly behind uh, uh, our uh, center during the year 2017. And uh, 2018, uh, uh, we have uh, started with IAC, which is called Institution Innovation Council, which has been established under the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Education, Government of India. Uh, so it's been fortunate I uh, uh, being part of this particular inaugural session, which has been held uh, in New Delhi uh, in 2018, November 21st. We started this particular new initiative. And uh, from there, uh, we were started slowly uh, moving uh, towards entrepreneurship and innovations and uh, various, uh, under this particular uh, cell, we have conducted uh, various programs, uh, uh, which is related to entrepreneurship, innovation, design thinking, and uh, uh, even the competitions and many programs we have organized. So, uh, and a lot of students, those are having uh, uh, the enthusiasm for uh, uh, dream of starting off their own venture has been achieved through these uh, forums. So, which has been uh, mainly helped them out and uh, brought them into a yeah, new level. And out of this particular uh, past uh, three years, uh, continuously we were uh, organizing various programs, and experts have been shared their knowledge with the students. And through that, uh, we can able to achieve. Uh, currently, there are three uh, companies are being incubated in our incubation center, which is the success story of our incubation center. So, uh, in that. Uh, uh, one of the company called uh, dropmygift.com, uh, which has been uh, our own alumni has been started and it's been successfully running on it. And the second one, which has been called as uh, 338 uh, uh, Incorporation, which is again a software development company. And that is also been uh, uh, created and developed by our own alumni itself. And the third venture, which has been called as uh, Taser Technologies. Uh, in this taser technologies, uh, even uh, uh, the VC venture capitalist has been joined uh, hand with our alumni and they started this particular uh, venture and it has all the three uh, been successfully running uh, for past one year in our campus and uh, all the three companies almost we have uh, around uh, 16 employees have been working. Uh, in this organization, it has been successfully running in our uh, campus. So this is one of the success story and along with that uh, uh, from IAC we have uh, uh, mainly fostering the innovation and entrepreneurship and through that uh, uh, we got the four star out of four star for this year and uh, past two years we got a four star out of five star and this is an uh, achievement which we made and along with that uh, even our faculty members have been attended uh, various programs which has been organized by uh, government of india and through that uh, we have uh, uh, made a lot of achievements 
So one of the achievements, uh, which is uh, like our uh, three of our faculty members have been uh, become advanced innovation ambassadors, uh, uh, the training which has been organized by Government of India under the Ministry of uh, uh, Innovation Cell. And along with that, five of the faculty members have become foundation uh, innovation ambassadors. So these are all the achievements which has been made by our faculty members along with the students also. Even the students also have got many laurels uh, to uh, our uh, IAC and uh, they have been participated in national innovation contest and they have went up to uh, sixth stage so till the poc even they uh, crossed the poc and next level they went and uh, so that is a biggest achievement which been made by our students and along with that uh, even our students got uh, young entrepreneurs award uh, from uh, cap skill development forum uh, from tamil Nadu. Uh, so uh, these are all uh, various achievements. Along with that, uh, we are also past two years, we are participating in uh, ATAL ranking, which is called ARIA ranking, uh, mainly for innovation uh, for the institution they are giving from the government of India. And uh, last year, uh, we got the uh, 26th rank uh, out of uh, the entire country. So uh, under band B. So that is the another achievements uh, which we uh, got uh, uh, through this particular uh, forum. So on this uh, occasions, I like to share this particular information to the entire uh, people who have been gathered here. Uh, and uh, this session is going to be a new uh, 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 concept, which is called system thinking. It's been an emerging trend. It's been there in the market. So on that, uh, we have invited a, a resource person who has been expertised into this, uh, Mr. Sakti Sharan. So he is going to share his knowledge with our uh, students as well as the faculty members. So on this uh, occasion, uh, uh, on behalf of the management and the entire uh, team gathered here, I welcome you, sir, uh, to uh, take over the session. Yeah, Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murganatham and uh, Ina and Varshini and uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, it's, uh, it's, as I said, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to be in conversation with you. So what we're going to try and do is... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, just a moment. I would like to tell more about you. Uh, then you may start, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah. Sorry, thank sorry you, Murganatham, sir. Yeah. Ina, you can... Proceed. Moving forward... It gives me great pleasure to give an introduction to our expert speaker of the day. Sakti Saran is a former management consultant and corporate sector executive who crossed over to the social sector in 2017. He works as a senior fellow at Pixera Global India. On joining the nonprofit sector, he quickly realized that aspiring for a thriving humanity and planet's calls for nothing less than a systematic view of life and has since been championing the case for addressing complex global challenges through a systems lens. He is an alum of India Leaders for Social Sector, Radical Transformation Leadership and CAPRA course and has a certification in systems thinking from Cornell University. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anna. Ina, uh, so Ina. I'm going to start sharing. Ina, sorry. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, you can, can you all see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to be putting this in uh, in slideshow. It's visible, right? My it's visible, sir. It's visible. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try and cover this in about 45 to 50 minutes. And then uh, we will have uh, about 10 minutes for uh, question and answers. Yeah, so if you have, you can start putting your questions in the chat and then maybe later on, Dr. Thomas or someone, uh, you know, one of you could maybe just uh, then read out the questions to me because I won't be able to look at the chat whilst, uh, uh, whilst I'm presenting. Yes, yeah, so what we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to first take you through why systems thinking, why is, what is the, why do we really need systems thinking? Uh, then I'm going to uh, spare a little bit of time on the evolution of systems thinking. Uh, you know, how is it, how is it that it actually evolved and why is it that we know relatively little about it? Yeah, then we're going to spend some time on some of the nuts and bolts of systems thinking 101, uh, the insights of uh, systems thinking and then applying systems thinking. So this deck is going to be shared with all of you. Uh, you don't have to take down notes. Uh, 
it's going to be presented to all of you and there's also a recording of this uh, of the session right at the end which i won't have time to go through as a set of resources yeah a set of links which you may want to just uh, check out in your in your spare time and these there also links to uh, some other courses and programs in uh, systems thinking so let's start with you know why systems thinking yeah uh, you know the pandemic really has brought to the fore uh, the 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 case for systems thinking it has uh, uh, it's if you actually take a look at it you know covid 19 is not just a healthcare crisis it's been a crisis of several proportions of several dimensions the underpinnings are in, of that of an ecological crisis the the consequences of that have been of an economic crisis yes yeah, so uh, covid 19 really has got us to uh, you know forced us in many ways to take a systemic view not that that systemic view the adoption has been complete or it's been perfect because if you look at you know the omicron virus strain that we're going through right now uh, it's a, a good reason for that is the uh, you know the inequality in vaccinations yeah so many african countries have not been have not benefited from the vaccines the way some other countries have and omicron originated from south africa which had one of the lowest vaccination rates yes yeah, so this is you know just to give you an example of uh, you know how we when we're talking of systems uh, and especially in the context of covid-19 then we are also talking about geopolitics we are talking about behavioral sciences we are talking of the role of the media we are talking of things like systemic racism all of this really comes together yeah <laughs> So there is this eminent uh, physicist and systems thinker called Fritjof Capra, and I don't know if uh, any of you have really heard of him, uh, but uh, you can check him out on the uh, on the net. And I have completed his course in 2020, and I'm also lead his study groups, uh, you know, for his for his programs. And what he has had to say is that you know the environmental degradation and inequality are, according to him, the the top contemporary challenges that we have today yeah and i like to just share this quote quotation of his with you to begin with i point out that these problems uh, energy environment climate change poverty inequality violence and war and so on are all systemic problems interconnected and interdependent and require corresponding systemic solutions so what this really means is that you can't see any of these challenges energy or inequality or violence in in isolation they all have they are all in some ways one in some ways or the other they are interconnected yeah that is what systems thinking that is why systems thinking is is so important yeah is to understand the interconnected nature of our existence yeah which is going to be the subject of today's session so when we are trying to solve uh, problems uh, or to address global challenges there is another problem that um, you know that we encounter and that is a problem of reality bias how do we you know when you and i you as a student or i as a systems thinking practitioner when we start thinking about problems we use a a mental model you know we use we try and solve a problem through a mental model of that problem yeah that is that is your process of cognition yeah it's uh, you're trying to firstly grasp the problem through that process of cognition which we refer to as a mental model yeah but, but these mental models very rarely do they actually match the systems uh, or problems that we are trying to understand or or we are trying to explain right so we must make use of feedback you know the feedback that we have in uh, you know in our daily lives to improve our mental models yeah so let's take the example of world hunger yeah world hunger you know there's still a lot of people who go hungry today uh, not just in india but across the world and this is nothing to do with agricultural production you know the planet our uh, mother nature has uh, has given us a lot of abundance yeah it's the, it is not a problem of shortage of scarcity yeah there is abundance but the problem of world hunger is not an agricultural it's not a production issue it's got is linked with political uh, with socio economic political uh, motivation and cultural factors yeah these are the causes of uh, you know world hunger 
So what causes this mismatch of, uh, you know, our mental models with respect to, uh, you know, with respect to reality? The real cause of these, uh, of this mismatch is in what we call refer to as reality bias. And why does reality bias, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, happen? Reality bias happens because each one of us, yeah, we are emotional human beings. We are cognitive human beings. Each one of us has got a our own perspective to this particular problem. Yeah, whether you look at, uh, you know, the religious divide or whether you look at any, any issue which, has, which is controversial is because it's one is trying to dominate our perspective over, you know, someone else. Yeah, so how do we, uh, how do we get conscious of our reality bias? So I'm going to make you watch a video which is going to take just like a little over a minute. It's by a video by Peter Senge who is, uh, you know, it's a very short video. The fifth discipline is systems thinking. What is systems thinking? Well, you can start off with what we just saying, the ability to see the consequences of my own actions. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also look at it from slightly different angles and say, you know, to see the, the, the connections in, in any situation and to understand better how things unfold over time because again we're reacting to an immediate situation that's always the truth something happens and we react we don't see how that situation may in fact have been influenced by things we did or contributed to doing in the past so to see more clearly how things unfold over time and to see the web of interconnectedness within which we always live and act is really the technical definition of systems thinking Okay, so that was just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, why we need systems thinking, because everything in our existence is interconnected. And as I go along this presentation, you'll understand, you know, sort of why. To be able to understand those interconnections is really the, uh, is the need for systems thinking. So... Um, just to recap this, this section uh, on why we need systems thinking, uh, remember that none of us really is, uh, is an island. And similarly, no organization, nor your college, nor your university. Yeah, we're all leading an interdependent life. That is the reality of the matter. Yeah, systems thinking can help us grasp the state of interconnectedness of our world. Yeah, to get that uh, fully into our mental model is is what systems thinking really will help us with. Yeah, it often systems thinking just helps us in framing the problem. Yeah, it makes communication a lot easier, clearer. And gaining convergence on the problem definition itself is a big step in solving it. Yeah, so this really is, is uh, the whole vision behind systems thinking is a unifying vision. Yeah, and as we will see, a very stark contrast from, uh, you know, the, the reductionist thinking in science you know, that we are all really familiar with. Yeah. So the evolution of systems thinking. Now, this is going to be, uh, I've tried my best, but I think I will need to get into a little bit of, uh, you know, a technical background here. I've tried to make this as simple as possible. I don't think it is very technical. And I think all of you as students would be, should be able to, you know, sort of grasp it. Yeah, at least try and look at, try and grasp the, the overall thought behind the evolution of systems thinking. Yeah, you don't, we don't need to get into specifics and into details, but I'd like you to take a look at this uh, particular uh, map. This is the, the evolution of science, yeah, from mechanism to holism. Is, is my screen clear? Can everyone see it very clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah, so starting from the, you know, the 14th or the 15th century with Copernicus and G Galileo Galilei, yeah, the world, you know, for the next two or 300 years had significant advancements in, you know, in the space of mechanism. Yeah, so science, you know, evolved, excuse me, science evolved very rapidly. And, uh, you know, the focus of science in this area, you know, from the middle 1400s till, uh, you know, I still the middle of the 18th century was really on quantification and measurement. And that is something which still prevails today, even in the 21st century. Uh, it's, uh, it's less than what it was in the 20th century. But that has been the drive to look at 
at the universe as a machine. Yeah, the drive of scientists in that area, you know, for almost uh, you know you know three hundred years, uh, culminating with Rene Descartes, uh, 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 Descartes and uh, this this uh, and uh, Sir Isaac Newton, was in uh, you know in this in this reality. Yeah, that the world was to be treated as a machine. It was governed by mathematical laws. Uh, that science has attempted to achieve certainty, uh, you know, and uh, uh, like, uh, well, and this whole thing about scientific skepticism, right? Uh, what uh, Rene de de Descartes mentioned that method, that this whole scientific method was based on radical doubt. Doubt everything until doubt ceases. Yeah, this was the whole philosophy of science, you know, for the first uh, 300 years, and it continued. It just it went on. But this is where the the larger, you know, mechanistic view of life emerged from. In this, the the scientists who were involved in this looked at mind and matter as completely two separate uh, phenomena. Um, space was seen as uh, was seen as absolute now all of this prevailed for over 300 years still you had the to maybe even more till you had uh, you know charles darwin who arrived on the scene and he came out with this whole thing about as you've all familiar with with biological evolution and the original he wrote uh, he authored that famous book called the origin of the species and, uh, you know, the Darwinian view, you know, sort of rejected the mechanistic view of, uh, you know, of life. So they these scientists discarded the Newtonian view of the world as a machine. So they created this new branch of science, which is holism. And holism is really the root of, uh, you know, systems thinking. So uh, as far as these uh, scientists, and these were, you know, mind you, they, they were all biologists. Whereas if you look at, you know, all the... Uh, the scientists before John Dalton, Isaac Newton, and all, they were either, you know, physicists or, or you know, specializing in chemistry. Yeah, but <clears throat> this was the new era, you know, when Charles Darwin came in, when, uh, you know, things started shifting. And the whole principle of evolution is very different from uh, evolution of the way the physicists see it. Yeah, so let's take a look at our sun, you know, as part of the solar system. Yeah, in a billion years from now, the uh, the sun will decay, it will die. Yeah, eventually this our solar system will die, right? So, and that we see that from the end of the every moment, yeah, every moment the sun is dissipating energy. It is, it's giving up its uh, its energy, it's losing its energy, right? So the, the physicist's view of, um, you know, of science was that evolution meant uh, you know, essentially decay. It meant leading from order to disorder. But the biologists looked at this very differently. And they looked at, uh, they saw that evolution, biological evolution was a move from a lower order to a higher order. And we know that because each one of us here today on this Zoom call, you know, has emerged from a single bacteria, you know, from a single cell bacteria. We have emerged as a species. Yeah, so there was a big, big, big change in the way uh, yeah, yeah, you know, science was sort of looked at. And the biologists were responsible for, you know, bringing about holism. And then you started, uh, you know, having a new and newer disciplines like biophysics and, and, you know, integration that happened. So moving fast forward to the 20th century, yeah, Albert Einstein was the, you know, the first scientist who actually, uh, you know, challenged the Newtonian view that space was absolute. And he came up with the theory of relativity. Uh, Albert Einstein was also a part of the group led by Niels Bohr, who came up with quantum theory. And the quantum theory, so this was the quantum, though uh, uh, Einstein single-handedly came up with the theory of relativity, the quantum theory was a, was a group effort. It was, uh, I think, four or five people, or maybe half a dozen people, scientists who came together. Yeah, as far as the, the quantum theory is concerned, right, um, the, the, the quantum theory was the, is the, was the, pivot, really the turning point where, you know, science, scientists started seeing that, look, there was a dead end in the, in the way the classical physicists viewed the universe and viewed the, viewed the world. And that happened because of particle physics. Yeah, it happened because, which, you, you know, subatomic physics is very different from conventional classical physics. So when you look at an atom and when you look at subatomic particles, yeah, they don't, they sometimes appear as particles and they sometimes, sometimes appear as 
uh, you know, as uh, light waves. Yeah, so there's this big paradox, you know, that how can ma that matter is sometimes matter and sometimes it's not. Yeah, so this is a big paradox that, uh, you know, quantum scientists, uh, you know, sort of discovered in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, they also realized that there was, you know, very strong alignment with, uh, you know, Eastern mysticism, with uh, Eastern philosophy. And, if, and for those of you who are familiar with Buddhism, yeah, we, uh, you know, the Buddha said everything is impermanent. So at a sub, sub, subatomic level, yeah, there was this whole uh, phenomenon, a phenomenon of impermanence. Yes. So subatomic particles have uh, uh, you know, no meaning as isolated entities, but can only be understood as interconnections between various processes of observations and and measures. It is a set of relationships, yeah, right? That is was the, really the founding, uh, you know, founding principle of systems, uh, you know, systems theory. It was uh, uh, only in 1928 that uh, an Austrian biologist called Ludwig von uh, Bertel, Bertel Lanfi developed the general systems theory, and he as a biologist, uh, you, you know, developed the whole science of, uh, of wholeness. It was a mathem ma mathematical the theory, uh, you know, based on, um, you know, on solid biology. Uh, this led to, uh, you know, a group of scientists led by Norbert Wiener in the, between the 1920s and the 1950s, and these were uh, you know, a group of mathematicians, neuroscientists, social scientists, and engineers who came together to form what was an interdisciplinary uh, field of cybernetics. Yeah, this gave further, uh, you know, advancement to, uh, you know, uh, to the, the whole discipline of systems thinking. Yeah, because for the first time, you really had people who, uh, you, you know, scientists from, from very different disciplines coming together uh, to come up with something which is interdisciplinary. And then finally in the 1970s and the 80s, yeah, with the advancement of, you know, supercomputers, yeah, there was a whole new branch of mathematics that was formed, which is called the complexity theory. And the complexity theory was, uh, is the theory of, uh, of, uh, is, the is the mathematics of, uh, of visuals, of patterns, you know, of uh, patterns such as attractors and fractals. Yeah, it is, it is not the mathematics of uh, formulae, which we are all familiar with. Yeah, all of us are familiar with uh, A plus B in brackets squared or X plus Y in brackets squared. That's the math mathematic of uh, formulae. But, uh, you know, there was a whole branch of uh, uh, mathematics, which is called, uh, uh, which is then called complexity theory, which is very non-linear. Yeah, and systems thinking is all about non-linear non dynamics. Now, what does this actually mean for us? Yeah, the, there are the two schools of science have striking differences. Yeah, they have moved on more or less opposite paths. Yeah, the reductionists thought of, um, you, you know, the universe and nature as a machine, uh, whereas the systems thinkers thought, think of the universe and nature as an organism. Yeah, and the reductionists thought that all I see all scientific knowledge as being certain, whereas the systems thinkers see all scientific knowledge as being approximate. Yeah, so there's, you know, the difference between uh, in one, on one school takes on a rational approach, the other school takes on an intuitive approach, uh, one is really based on uh, analysis of so breaking down, which we're all very familiar with, you know, when you keep breaking down, breaking down, reducing, and you keep analyzing, 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 you get to a subatomic uh, particle. And that's when, you know, things kind of start rebounding. Yeah, so uh, systems thinkers really think about synthesis, they think about integrating, yeah, instead of reducing. And they are based on, uh, you know, on nonlinear dynamics. And as we go through, we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about nonlinear dynamics. There's been a big emphasis on quality over quantity, and uh, you know, in um, uh, in in the mechanistic view of life, and the reason why we are touched more by the mechanistic view of life uh, than by the holistic view of life is because science and technology, yeah, whether it is the internet, whether it is the uh, whether whether it is an automobile or a mo motorcycle that we drive, yeah, these have all been have been all offshoots of reductionist science. And reductionist science has had the strongest backing from the world of commerce and economics. Yeah, which is why uh, reductionist science, even today in the 21st century, you know, sort of dominates. But systems thinking is catching up. There's more and more people 
you know, who are looking at, uh, you know, life and looking at their work from a systems thinking lens. Yeah, I want to just make one last comment. This is not to say that, you know, that we have to choose between the two fields. Yeah, both are have their own respective, uh, you know, uh, plus points as well as their limitations. Yeah, so I'm not trying to build a case of, uh, you know, one or the other. I'm trying to build a case for why it's, it's really important for us to look at, uh, uh, at things at life and at our work from a systems thinking lens. Yeah, so we're going to go into, you know, systems thinking, uh, you know, 101, and I'm going to run another video past you. This is by uh, Linda Booth Sweeney, who is, uh, this is, uh, let me just. You're ready. Oh, okay. Some people study rocks. Some people study medicine. Some people study French cooking. Oh, Louise. I study systems. A system has two or more parts that interact to form a whole. Systems are everywhere, from the smallest cell to your family, to a community, to the earth. These are all systems. And things in our everyday life are a part of systems. Let's take me as an example and this pile of laundry. My daughter is so happy to see her tie-dye. What's the difference between me and this laundry? Well, if you think about it, if you take this t-shirt out of the pile, does it change the functioning of this pile? Not really, just one less thing that I have to fold. But if I took my stomach, let's say, out of the body, that would change things, right? The stomach wouldn't work on its own and the body would definitely not work without the stomach. But if the heart and the lungs and the nervous system and the stomach are all interacting, they produce behaviors like speed or jumping or breath. That's the difference between a system and a heap. We don't see systems walking around. There's no lines drawn between connections. We have to imagine those connections ourselves. It's the interconnection in systems that produce something greater. It's the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Like the breathtaking beauty we see in a national park, the wolves and the moose and the aspen trees and the yellow warblers, all interacting in different types of relationships that maintain ecosystem balance. We can't see the connections that are occurring, but if I understand how they interact, I understand that taking a top predator out of a system will influence the whole. When we start to imagine those connections, how this affects that, then we shift our perspective from just the pieces to patterns that form a whole. And then we're starting to see the systems around us. And when we see them, then we can better understand them. All right, so that was uh, Linda Booth Sweeney, an author, a whole systems pioneer and founder of Toggle Labs. You can check her out on the internet. Uh, so I'm gonna try and recap. I wish I could have done a poll with all of you, but we don't have the time. Uh, so what is a system? Yeah, <clears throat> and this is from the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah, it's a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network, a, a complex whole. Yeah, for example, the state railway system. Or it could be a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, an organized scheme or method, example, a multi-party system of government. So a system, yeah, for all of you on the call, could be either an organism, a thing, a phenomenon, or an idea, an integrated whole whose essential properties arise from the relationship between its parts. Yeah, this is really the crux. Yeah, if you've got this definition, if you've understood this, yeah, it is whose essential properties arise from the relationship between its parts. Yeah, you've understood systems, right? So each one of us is a member of many systems. We are a member of a family, a community, a church, a company. Uh, each one of us is a complex biological system comprising many smaller systems, but, uh, but you know, so your human cell is, uh, is a system by itself, but our biological system is a part of a larger earth system, which is part of a planetary system and so on. Uh, 
Every day we interact with dozens of systems such as automobiles, retail stores, our employer, etc. And occasionally we interact with the healthcare system or the education system. The most common definition of a system is a group of two or more distinct and interrelated parts. Interrelationships are essential. A system is different from a collection of parts, examples, tools in a toolbox, or the laundry pile that you saw Linda Booth Sweeney talking about, where no interrelationships exist. Whenever we add people, we almost always convert a collection into a system. Right? So this was uh, an introduction to systems, but you know, there are different types of systems. All systems are not the same. And I'm giving you right now on this slide, you know, a classification of the four main types of systems. And on the sex, next slide, I'm, I'm going to show, introduce you to another dimension to systems. But whilst we're on this slide, yeah, systems can be either simple, simple, they can be complicated, complex, or complex adaptive. A simple system is typically a system which has offers one single path to one single answer. Yeah, a recipe, for example, yeah, is is a is a, is a simple system. A complicated system is a system in which multiple, it offers multiple paths to a single answer. Yeah, there is only one correct solution. Yeah, so it could be a Boeing plane, it could be an automobile engine, it could be a space rocket. These are examples of complicated systems. Then we have complex systems which offer multiple paths to multiple answers. Yeah, uh, it could be a poverty alleviation program, it could be a healthcare system. And then you have complex adaptive systems, and we're, you're going to see soon a video on complex adaptive systems. These are systems which keep changing. Yeah, they systems which are changed based on the choices that are made. And as a result of these choices, the answers keep changing. Yeah, so racism, climate change, insect colonies, birds, swarms, financial markets are examples of complex adaptive systems. Now we have four further classification of systems. Yeah, and are they open? Can systems be open or closed? Can they be non living or can they be, are they living? Yeah, open systems are systems, yeah, which, uh, you know, permit the flow of information, energy, or matter between the system and the environment which is external to it. Yeah, and so that's an open system. Uh, you know, a coffee, a cup of coffee without a lid. Yeah, is, is an example of an open system. A closed system is one which allows only energy transfer, but no transfer of mass. Yeah, strictly speaking, you know, closed systems do not exist. I mean, in this example, uh, you know, a, a hot cup of coffee with a lid, yeah, without any hole in it, yeah, would be an example of a closed system. But, you know, if you go back to, you know, what Einstein taught us, you know, the relationship between energy and mass, Right, so uh, there is strictly speaking, closed systems do not exist. But you know, for classification purposes, uh, you know, in thermodynamics and uh, you know, in physics, you come across uh, this term for closed systems. Non-living systems, best explained to you with a crystal of sugar. Yeah, what is sugar? A sugar is nothing but a, a particular. It's a pattern. It's a pattern of uh, a particular pattern of the. Uh, you, you know, of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecule, um, uh, atoms of carbon, uh, hydrogen, and oxygen really coming together. A particular configuration of these patterns, patterns is what manifests in, in what we call a sugar. Yeah, but living systems is uh, a human cell, a single cell bacteria, which is the first uh, non-living organism on the, on the planet, is what we call as a living system. And how do living systems and non-living systems, how do we make a distinction between the two? No, living systems are systems which display the characteristics of life. And this could, you could write a PhD just on this. Yeah. And uh, which includes, uh, you know, some of the characteristics of life just for our purpose, for our discussion here could include metabolism, respiration, reproduction, adaptation, self-organization, and cognition. Note that the, the, the crystal of sugar has none of these characteristics, yeah, which is what makes the distinction between uh, you know, a living and a non-living system. Yeah, and finally, living systems are always open systems, and they are also complex adaptive systems, CAS. Yeah, I'm going to run, take you through a very interesting video. It's, uh, you know, on complex adaptive systems. So you get an idea of what are complex adaptive systems. Yeah, remember, complex adaptive systems are all living systems. They're all open systems. Let's watch this.
The systems that you are part of and that you care about are complex. <laughs> they're made up of many independent and connected parts, and they're adaptive. Their parts are constantly adjusting, refining, converting, integrating, based on what is happening in the world around them. The study of complex adaptive systems, or CAS, can help us understand the world and think in new ways to solve problems. For centuries, we looked at complex systems like these and wondered, how do they work? How do millions of birds collectively flying in one direction turn in an instant and all begin flying in another direction? Initially, we assumed that it must be the result of some amazingly efficient leadership structure where an alpha bird of some kind gave crystal clear directives to the flock. We soon learned that there was no leader. There were only simple rules that each bird followed according to what its nearest local neighbors were doing. Remember, there is no leader. No bird has overall command and control. There is no global scale awareness of the whole system. It is just a whole mess of birds and a few simple rules that they follow. What we are seeing is a remarkable phenomenon called a superorganism, a system that is made up of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of individual organisms, but that acts like it is a single organism. We can learn a lot about how to design and implement complex adaptive systems from the experts, from nature, things like ants, birds, and fish. Here's an example of simple rules leading to complex behaviors in a human system. Simple, but with a big effect. All human systems are complex adaptive systems too. We are independent agents following local simple rules leading to emergent complexity. Sometimes it can be hard to see the rules, but they are there. And if you understand them deeply, you can see that they are amazingly simple. All right, I hope you enjoyed those videos. Uh, I'm gonna just move on. So this was uh, Professor Derek Cabrera, who's a professor of systems thinking at Cornell University. Okay. I, I had Wake it. Wake up out there. So, so I hope you're paying attention because this is important. Sorry about that. I forgot to switch that video off. Okay, so <clears throat> By now, I think you would have got some idea of what a system is, right? We've covered the evolution of science, you know, where how science has actually evolved and continues to evolve. We've covered basically, you know, what a system is, the different types of systems. We've had a deep dive into a complex adaptive system. But what is systems thinking? Yeah, systems thinking is an approach. Yeah, remember, go back to why, you know, the very first section about why do we need systems thinking? Yeah, it's a system thinking is an approach to integration based on the knowledge that component parts of a system will act differently when isolated from the system's environment or from other parts of the system. Yeah, this is this is very crucial. Yeah, if <coughs> take a take a minute and try and kind of sort of grasp this. Yeah, it's it's basically that set of interrelationships between a component part and its whole that really determines the system's behavior. In practice, systems thinking encourages us to explore interrelationships, multiple perspectives, and distinctions or boundaries. It is counterintuitive approach in approach and insights help in identifying leverage points and simple rules. It is in sharp contrast to reductionist thinking, which focuses on breaking down and isolating smaller and smaller pieces of a system. So what are some of the tools of, uh, you know, a systems thinker? Yeah. So as I mentioned to you earlier in the 
in the early 1920s to the 1950s, there was this whole move from single disciplines to interdisciplinary work. Yeah, so systems thinking champions, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary work. It's 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 a, it's basically a key tool of systems thinking is is to look out for interconnectedness. And you would have seen this in in all the three videos that I have, you know, sort of shared with you. Interconnectedness, patterns, relationships. They all pretty much are saying the same thing. Yeah, it's a, a move from linear from a linear existence to a circular or non-linear existence. Life, if, if you see nature, the way, and uh, you, you know, the way, if you just look at a cloud, you, you know, a cloud that it's, I don't know if it's cloudy today right now in Bangalore, but if you just look at a cloud, yeah, the shape of a cloud is just not linear. Yeah, it's that most of nature is non-linear. Yeah, you do have exceptions. Yeah, there is linearity. The earth takes exactly 365 days to revolve around the sun. That is, that's linear. But that those are exceptions. Most of nature is really non-linear. Yeah, most of nature does not exist in silos. When you look at a whole ecosystem, if for those of you who actually, you know, who go for hikes, or if you go to, you know, outside Banar Gatha, when you have the, uh, you know, the park out there uh, on your way to IAM Bangalore, yeah, you see, if you just go for a hike out there, you'll just see nature coming together, right? Or if you go into Kavan Park, or if you go to any one of your, you just see nature coming together. It's uh, it's the a whole ecosystem that is thriving with interdependence. Nothing in nature is existing in silos. Yeah, so, which is why systems thinkers move away from the study of paths to the study of paths in relationship to the whole. Yeah, I've already covered this before. Uh, systems thinking is about the shift from analysis to synthesis. Uh, it's moving from objects to relationships. Yeah, so that, uh, and, and uh, because you're moving from objects to relationships, yeah, systems thinkers are more concerned about qualitative aspects than about quantitative aspects. Yeah, that's simply because uh, configurations of relationships. Yeah, what are these configurations of relationships that repeat themselves? They are patterns. Yeah, the studying of patterns is not a quantitative uh, exercise. It is an exercise in understanding qualities. Yeah, right. So a systems thinker is yeah, will not ignore uh, will not it will not ignore quantification, but will give a lot of emphasis to the qualitative aspects of the system rather than the quantitative aspects. Yeah, this is, so I'm going to take you through, you know, four tools of uh, systems thinking. Uh, these are some of the tools and uh, these are all, all four slides that you're seeing here are from, from Cornell University, from the course that I attended uh, by Professor Derek Cabrera. The first thing is the ability to draw distinctions, to draw boundaries. Yeah, the important thing is that when you're drawing distinctions, you're drawing it with awareness. Because if you don't draw this with awareness, you're going to end up in enhancing your biases, not removing your biases. Yeah, but the distinctions uh, distinctions uh, make sense from a, from a lens of understanding. Yeah, uh, it's, so let's take some examples of uh, when we say distinctions. When I speak about racism, yeah, racism and inclusiveness, you know, are mutually exclusive. If I'm... If, if there is racism, there cannot be inclusiveness, yeah, right? So we draw a distinction between racism and inclusiveness, between dogma and openness, right? So these are just examples of distinctions. Yeah, uh, system thinking is nothing but a metacognition. It's a framework within which for us to understand problems. It's a framework for us to frame, prob uh, for us to frame problems. Yeah, so one of the tools that we use as system thinkers is that of distinction. The second one, the second tool is about the part and the whole. Yeah, you already got a sense of part and whole. Yeah, remember that what makes something a part is that it belongs to a whole. And what makes something a whole, you know, it has, it has, a, it has, it has several parts. They co-imply each other. Yeah, so if you look at the states in India, uh, you know, the, each state is a part of a larger, uh, feder uh, a, a larger federation. Right. Or if you look at the food chain, yeah, uh, you could treat, you know, the food chain as a whole, but then the parts of it would include grains, meats, dairy, fats. You can further break down fats into uh, saturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, so on and, and so forth. Yeah, these are your parts and wholes. The next is the next tool is that of patterns and relationships. 
In business, politics, environment, and in our personal and social lives, relationships create networks and ecosystems. Networks and ecosystems are nothing but a manifestation of patterns. Yeah, other manifestation of patterns are like feedback cycles, uh, boundaries. Yeah, all of these are uh, a manifestation of patterns, right? So uh, a, a, pat uh, a pattern is a configuration of a relationship characteristic of a particular system, right? So... Uh, <clears throat> The, if you just look at the uh, our own solar system, or if you just look at the Earth, uh, our our planet, and our moon, yeah, the whole connection between uh, you, you, you know the Earth and the moon is is manifest in ocean tides. Ocean tides is nothing but a pattern. It's a study of a pattern. Yeah, every every rule, uh, you know, has two uh, has two or a pattern has two parts to it. It's an action and then a reaction. So let's, uh, so if you take, take a magnet, yeah, a magnet the, uh, leads to a reaction of bringing, uh, you know, iron particles to a magnet. Yeah, pollution has a relationship. Pollution is, is related to acid rain. Pollution causes acid rain. So these are relationships. These are patterns. Or a feedback loops. Uh, you, you know, many of you, if you've done a projects or some of you are doing a, you know, a research project, you would come have come across this term of feedback loop of self amplifying or self di diminishing loop, yeah, which we refer to as positive feedback loops or negative feedback loops. These are just nothing but patterns. And finally, uh, uh, the, another tool is the tool of perspectives. Yeah, the ability to understand different points of view. And I think the the best example, you know, and I've I've seen very many people, you know, use this example, and which is why I've also picked it up here. Perspectives matter, and if you've heard of the story of the seven blind men and the and the elephant, I think just about every one of you would have heard of that story. Yeah, each each one of the seven men had a very different perspective of. Uh, you know what that that creature was it's only when you got when when you got the perspectives of all seven together could you put could you actually frame that that this was an elephant right so very similarly in systems thinking systems thinkers are not led by ideology they're not led by left wing right wing they're not led by uh, by you know by by dogma or by ideology they're just led by different points of view yeah there is a gravitation towards a universal point of view to be able to see reality as objective as objectively as you can and for which is why perspectives matter yeah and i'm giving you some examples uh, when we had the start of the pandemic in the in the U.S., you had the politicians in the U.S. saying the virus originated in China and it was allowed to spread to the world. Yeah, the uh, the the Chinese politicians, on the other hand, uh, you know, went on record saying that the U.S. is incompetent in managing the pandemic. Yeah, so you had different points of view, you know, that emerged uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, even today. Yeah, and sometimes you could say the you know someone. You know, might just say the bottle is half full, but the someone else might say the bottle is half empty. Who is right, right? So <clears throat> this is just to give you, uh, you know, an idea of what uh, the tools that systems thinkers use, right? Now I'm going to take you through um, quickly some insights from systems thinking. I have about, I think, uh, another six slides. I'm going to try and finish this like soon so that we have at least some time for question answers. So. It's, the key insights that you get from systems thinking is, and I want you to go back to the example of the flock of birds. You can't change behavior at a systemic level. Yeah, it's like kind of impossible. Yeah, collective behavior cannot be changed at a collective level. Yeah, but, but you can engage in systemic thought and systemic thought, you know, can, can reveal to us some of the simple ideas and the rules that underlie these complex systems. So what are these rules? Yeah, so if you saw Derek Cabrera's uh, video, he spoke about three rules, stay together, avoid predators and obstacles, don't crash into each other. Yes, yeah, so when you look at the, that sphere of, uh, you, you know, of, uh, of, you know, of, of uh, the actual rules of the simple causes, yeah, you can actually influence, you can, you can manage behavior by trying to manage or change the rules. You cannot manage behavior at a macro level. You cannot manage behavior at a collective level. Yeah, that, and I'm gonna give this to you with an example. Yeah, you understood the flock of birds and the stadium waves. Yeah, in, um, in the flock of birds, the agents were the birds. 
in the stadium wave, uh, the agents were the spectators. Yeah, in the case of the stadium wave, uh, the simple rule was stand up when your right neighbor stands up and sit down when they sit down. Yeah, but let's take a case of racism. Yeah, who are the agents in race of, of in in racism? Yeah, and this, by the way, this has got this is extracted from some work that I had done for the nonprofit that I work for. My nonprofit is an American nonprofit. It's is Washington D.C. based. So the example I've given to you is really of um, you know racism in America. Yeah, it's um, the agent's perspective is to pay attention locally, not globally. And what are the simple rules? Associate, associate with people who have a common identity. Yeah, that is the, the key rule of racism. Subscribe to biases of superiority and inferiority. Mimic perceived superior behavior. These are all the rules that rules that govern racism. Yeah, and I'm gonna take you through an example later on on how we can actually try and change these rules. Yeah, but you can't change racism at a macro level. Yeah, you can try and bring about policy uh, regulations, this, that, and all, but it will have limited effects. The root causes really are, uh, you, you know, these three that I have, you know, sort of mentioned to you. And then you can expand on these root causes. Yeah, it's invariably got to do with individual biases. All right. Another example of insights from systems thinking. And uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Donella Meadows. Um, she was the one who... Uh, you know, came up with that seminal book called The Limits to Growth, uh, but that was many years ago. You would, chances are you would not have heard of Donella Meadows. She's the late Donella Meadows. And she came up with this thing called leverage points. What are leverage points? These are places within a complex system where a small shift in one thing can produce a big change in everything else. And let's give this to you with an example. In 1986, uh, the U.S. government introduced a, a policy which required every manufacturing plant to report emissions data without imposing penalties, right? Uh, that I've underlined that, without imposing penalties. The mere act of sharing information in the public domain led to dramatic reduction in emissions since many corporations found value in not appearing on the top 10 polluter list, which the government of, of the United States would uh, monthly or periodically, you know, sort of publish. Right, so this is an example of non-linear uh, behavior. Yeah, where a very small input or very small change has led to an, uh, you know, led to an exponential, you know, sort of an outcome. This is what systems thinking is about. It's about non-linear dynamics. Yeah, how do you actually look at, you know, move away from a, li a linear construct? Okay, and how we how do we apply systems thinking? Right, so we don't have time for that. But I'm going to just take you through uh, one part of it. See, planning for systems change. Now, this is taken from a guide, which is called systems change, a guide to what it is and how to do it. Yeah, it's, uh, and you've more or less understood, I've taken you through uh, understanding systems thinking, the understanding the needs and the assets. You're engaging in multiple actors, which is also multiple perspectives. We will have only time for mapping the systems here. Doing systems change is something for you to explore. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we don't have the time to get into that. But I'm just gonna give you examples. And, and I'm sorry if this, uh, this, this uh, chart appears to you, uh, uh, you know, very fuzzy because the, the original work has been done in a software called Plectica. Yeah, Plectica is a software mapping tool. And this is just nothing but a screenshot from that, which I've reproduced here in PowerPoint. Yeah, so when we look at the challenge of, uh, you know, ocean plastics, yeah, <clears throat> how do we actually solve the problem of ocean plastic? Firstly, we need to understand it. We need to bring, uh, you know, bring all the actors uh, together on board. Yeah, and you do this through, through, through three key uh, avenues. One is through visible measurable outputs to identify new substitutes, you know, um, setting up uh, waste disposal centers, uh, you know, recycling um, uh, measures, uh, you know, in providing incentives for reuse. Uh, these are examples of visible measurable outputs. Uh, these are, uh, but in addition to that, you need to look at systemic shifts. Yeah, so these systemic shifts include, you know, redefining materials, life cycle pathways, 
uh, you know, coming up with, uh, an, you know, different approaches to packaging, for example, uh, new business models, uh, you know, new uh, economics, uh, creating new market demand for recycled material, for example, new behaviors in terms of the way, uh, you know, I consume or you consume, uh, and new policies. These are all examples of systemic shifts. Yeah, each one of you in your individual capacities, yeah, has, has got the power to, you know, to make make these systemic shifts. And then, of course, there's transformational leadership, there's dissemination of systems thinking, uh, building emotional intelligence capabilities. I'm giving you another example of uh, a systemic racism. Systemic racism is distinct from inclusiveness, which you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, systemic racism, if I was to look at the root causes, and by the way, systems thinking is all about getting down to root causes. It's about understanding root causes, right? So. <clears throat> It's very different from an engineering mindset. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all about getting to root causes. It's all about looking at uh, different factors in relationship to the whole. Yeah, so the causes for systemic racism have got to do with individual behavior, with societal norm, with institutional policies, and with the structural framework, which includes our legislation, our governance, you know, and the management of police. And again, I'm sorry that this is a, a US example because mm -hmm. this, is, this is the one that I had that I wanted to share. And when you look at the bottom of the screen, you look at also wanting to understand racism from different lenses. Yeah, you look at, you need to understand racism from the way fair-skinned people think about it. How and people, non-African people of color think about racism and how dark-skinned people think about, each one has a different perspective of what constitutes racism, right? So it's, it's important that you get a full 360 degrees view of, uh, you know, your subject and systems thinking is what really enables that. And finally, I'm going to uh, just share this map with you. It's an illustration from uh, Fritjof Capra's book, Systems View of Life, page 365. It's about, uh, he's trying to depict the urgency of our economics, that you cannot have unlimited growth on a finite planet. And looking at the interconnections between population growth, between corporate growth, fossil fuels, uh, rising temperatures. If, for those of you who have been monitoring COP26, you know, the depletion of, uh, of planetary resources, the rising of food prices, so on and so forth. Yeah, this is just, is all about mapping. Yeah, and this visualization and mapping is uh, an integral pillar of systems thinking. Yeah, these are the resources I'm going to leave behind with you. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, I hope you you know, sort of found this uh, session worthwhile and useful. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, over to you. If you have any questions, we could engage in it. I don't know if uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, how much time we have left, but uh, I leave it to you. I'm okay to go on for another 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, but I, uh, I trust that, uh, you know, as, uh, I, I, if, if it's, it's going to conflict with you, we can, we can wind that up, uh, wind this up earlier. Yeah, so over to you, Dr. Thomas, and to, uh, to Ina and uh, Varshini. Uh, so Part thank participants, the students, yes. uh, the forum is open for Q&A session. You can ask questions. I hope, uh, I hope this wasn't a very heavy a subject. I've tried to make it as light as possible. Uh, and uh, as I told you, you will have a copy of this presentation and uh, you know, do go over it. And you can always reach out to me on email uh, or also one-on-one -on -one in case uh, you, know, you, you want to discuss anything. Uh, Saran sir, I've shared the, um, you know, the, uh, the blog details, the emails and all those things with the participants. Um, as a starter, I would uh, want to ask one question. Uh, like, what is the difference between uh, systems thinking and a newer concept which is coming up, which is design thinking? Yes, so uh, design thinking is, uh, is, is, basically, uh, uh, is basically a discipline, a field of, um, you know, of empathy. So when you're looking at product design or service design, or uh, the, the uh, see design thinking, if you actually look at the, uh, the, the genesis of design thinking, my former employer, IBM, 
uh, played a big role 50 or 70 years ago in design thinking on designing mainframe computers. Yeah, but I'm going to fast forward today to you know, contemporary, what we refer to as design thinking today. Design thinking today is very significantly and very largely related to the cyber world. Yeah, it's related to the way you and I interact with a website or with an app, a mobile phone app or an, uh, an app on your iPad. It's about the actual layout of the screen. Yeah, how do you make uh, the design of uh, an application or of a website or of a web page, you know, something that would, uh, you know, glue the, the person who's actually using it. Yeah, that is about, all about design thinking and it's, it's through a process of empathy. Yeah, it's a process of empathy, it's a process of, uh, you know, sort of prototyping. It's, uh, uh, it's got principles of psychology and design, you know, built, in, uh, built into it. Right, so that is design thinking. It's it, the application of design thinking is in today's context, when people talk of design thinking is very specific to the cyberspace, it could also be extended to product design. Yeah, when you, when you look at systems thinking, you're, you're moving from uh, you know, the world of commerce to social sciences. You're moving from, uh, uh, you, you don't, you're, 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 it's, it's very extensively permeating the space of social sciences. Yeah, I would just put that at, uh, you know, that level. I mean, again, systems thinking is just very broad, a very deep subject. But uh, in summary, this is what it would be, uh, Dr. Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Uh, Sakti Saran, sir, uh, I have one question. Yes, please. <clears throat> Actually, uh, this uh, system thinking, uh, how it can uh, can be related with uh, uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship? Can you just uh, give some insight on that? Yes. So, um, so if uh, if we look at innovation and uh, entrepreneurship, right? So if I'm I'm going to share. Uh, I want to share that screen. Uh, you know, uh, back to you. Uh, you know, allow me to share that screen. Uh, the one, the map that I had of ocean plastic. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm in the deck itself. So, <clears throat> what you're seeing here is a system. Is a system map of what needs to be done to tackle the challenge of ocean plastic, right? The uh, tackling ocean plastic requires us to do all three things, not one, not the other, and not the third. It's, it's a combination of all three things coming together. Now you as an entity, yeah, or as Kristu Jayanti College, you may not have, you know, uh, the complete uh, a set of resources to deal with everything in unison. And it's not important that I, as an individual, you know, try and take on this mega challenge. I can't do it. It's impossible. Even my nonprofit organization cannot possibly do it. But we will work with partners. We will work with partners uh, where we, we will join hands so that we can arrive at a holistic response. As far as, and to answer your question about entrepreneurship, yeah, if an entrepreneur focuses on developing new substitutes, yeah, new substitutes for plastic, yeah, that's an example of innovation, of entrepreneurship. New business models is an example of entrepreneurship. The, the, the important caveat here is that, that you should not be seeing this in isolation. You should be, uh, as an entrepreneur, you must be thinking of the larger problem that, this, that your innovation is solving. Yeah, if you see this as only in isolation, then that is not systems thinking. Yeah, can you be a part of a larger movement? Can you support a larger movement for, uh, you know, for coming up for tackling ocean plastic? That's when you're getting into systems thinking. Yeah, uh, but, but uh, innovation, entrepreneurship is completely compatible with, uh, you know, with systems thinking. And, and I've just given this to you with, uh, with one example. There could be many examples in, in, uh, in the disposal uh, area or in recycling or in reusing. There's uh, a whole lot of uh, possibilities for social innovation and entrepreneurship. Here. Yeah, but are you going to do what you're going to do in isolation? Or are you going to try and connect that with a larger movement? and contribute to the larger goal 
of tackling ocean plastic. Yeah, that is, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, yes, sir. it's very much. So anybody else like to uh, ask questions, you can ask, unmute, you can ask, or you can put it in the chat box also so that uh, we can share it to sir, so that uh, he can answer your questions. So feel, feel free to reach out to me on email or LinkedIn. I, I also uh, write a blog on, on very general purpose uh, topics. Uh, and you can feel free to check that out and see if you've come across anything interesting. Yeah, I'm always happy to, you know, sort of engage with uh, with students. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Anna, uh, you can please take over. Sure, sir. Uh, I request each and everyone to fill the feedback form. I has been sent in the chat box. You can click on the link and you can fill the form. Thank you, Sharon, sir, for such an informative talk. A pleasure. Yeah, there is one question that's come in the chat, uh, Ina. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, Abhilash who has asked this question. Uh, how mm -hmm. systems thinking helps us to think out of the system? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so remember what I told you, a system is always is a part it's a uh, each system is a part of a larger system which is again a part of a larger system which is a part of a larger system so by definition systems thinking doesn't have any boundaries yeah you are uh, abhilash uh, the if you go, go back to that example that i gave you of uh, of the of the cell yeah the eat the human body yeah has we all you know we have 8 trillion cells in our body each cell is a part of uh, is a part of what we call the larger body, but my body is part of the larger human race, which is a part of the uh, ecosystem, which is a part of the um, you know of uh, the planet, which is a part of the solar system, and you can kind of sort of uh, you know expand boundaries all the way up to the universe, right? So this may not be the best example that I've I've given to you, but uh, uh, but it is a good example of how system thinking can help you. Uh, you know, uh, go out of the, uh, think out of the box. And this could be in, in any spheres. If you look at the insights, you know, that, uh, that, that I shared with you of Danello Meadows. Yeah, Danello Meadows uh, uh, is, a, is a classic example, you know, for those who are management consultants or those who aspire to become management consultants of how you can think out of the box by, by coming up with a very small change in policy, how it could lead to an exponential impact on pollution. Yeah, that is pure out of the box thinking, right? That is a, that would be the best example of out of the box uh, from your standpoint, Abhilash. Yes, so I, I hope that, uh, that answers your question, Abhilash. All right, so Abhilash has said yes. All right. So on that note, uh, Ina, I'm handing it back to you, and I think we can close uh, close our session now. Sure, sir. Every beginning has an ending. Now I call Gunesho for the vote of thanks. Hope I'm audible. Good evening to all. Language shapes the way we think and determines what we can think about. Rightly quoted by Benjamin Lee Roof. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable location. First and foremost, I thank a special guest, Mr. Shakti Saran Sir, Senior Fellow, Fixra Global India, who despite his busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion. I would also like to thank our Dr. Father Augustine George, Principal, Christo Jainti College, Autonomous, Bengaluru, for his stewardship, support, vision, and commitment. Also, I would like to thank the management and staff, Christo Jainti College, Autonomous Bengaluru, Dr. A. Murganandam, sir, President, Christo Jainti Incubation Center, Dr. Ter Cherian Thomas, sir, Documentation in Charge, Christo Jainti Incubation Center, Christo Jainti Incubation Center, core team members, guests who have joined this meeting, especially the colleagues, mentees, and friends of Mr. Shakti Saran, sir. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the students and the program organizers 
Mr. Abilash for brochure presentation, Ms. Enna for the master of ceremony, Ms. Versini for the welcome speech, who made this occasion a grand success. Thank you all, and I remain. Thank you, Bhavnesh. Uh, before winding up... Uh, As we have come to an end. Yeah, uh, Enna, uh, before winding up, can everyone uh, switch on your video so that we can have a group photo? I request uh, uh, students and faculty members, please uh, display your video so that uh, uh, we can take a group photo, which will be used for our documentation purpose. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, before winding up, uh, personal, on a personal note, I would like to thank uh, Shakti sir and sir. A um, uh, few things to note from him is that uh, we approached him. Uh, though I am a stranger to him, he accepted our invitation uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, second thing to note is that uh, more than us, actually, he was eager. On January 2nd, he sent, us, sent me an email stating that a reminder stating that 28th, we have a meeting. Okay, so he kept me on my toes till the, uh, you know, uh, uh, till the meeting was over. So uh, special thanks to you, sir. And uh, he is a person who is very eager to meet students. So uh, it's on his own personal motivation that he has, you know, uh, come and he has shared the, you know, knowledge with all of you. So I thank, uh, you know, on behalf of the Christian College uh, Management our uh, KGIC members and all the students who are present over here, a special note of thanks to you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Morganatham. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be a part of you, and thank you for inviting me and having me over. Yeah, and to all of you for, who are studying at uh, Christu Jayanti College, my very best wishes in, the, in your career and your future progress. Yeah, and keep thinking out of the box. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a wonderful session. Yes. All right. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Bhuvneshwar. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Murgan, sir. Yeah. Jasmine, ma'am. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma thank you, Jasmine, ma'am, for joining. Sir, I'll end the meeting.